so welcome back everyone um i hope you can all hear me and see me well so um we're now going to have the last talk of today and finish the theoretical background for the upcoming two days of hands-on mobile brain body imaging um, sessions that we will have tomorrow and the day after and um, i will be talking about mobile brain body imaging short mobi what it is from my perspective from the perspective of our group um, why we think it is important and how we approach mobile brain body imaging um, and um, a few words to my background i am an experimental psychologist by training um, so i come from the psychology side um, to the mobi field and i was interested and still am primarily interested in understanding spatial cognitive processes and the neural basis of how we realize all these fantastic feats that we are able to do like orienting in new environments without getting lost too often um, finding home even in the dark or with um, impaired vision um, all these really complex cognitive processes that are based on uh, several senses, basically, which we were never able to investigate in the lab. I, I am a classic EEG researcher. I started with traditional desktop EEG back in 1998 and even forced my participants to stare at a fixation cross in the middle of the screen and did not allow them to blink. They were allowed to blink um, in the breaks between trials. And from there, I started moving on to trying to understand how is it possible that we as humans um, are able to do all these higher complex cognitive um, um, functions and what and why um, um, can we, uh, or what and how can we investigate basically the neural basis of all the other really important sensors specifically for spatial orienting, like vestibular information when every time we turn around, we have acceleration information that is processed automatically by the brain. Egocentric representations are updated based on this information, proprioception, motor commands, and all these other senses that contribute to cognitive function, we were never able to investigate. Um, so when I did my postdoc in Munich after uh, my PhD in Aachen and in psychology, I went on to Munich and did more desktop-based um, EEG experiments, but started moving into more complex 3D dimensional um, spatial cognitive orienting tasks, still desktop-based, and then moved on to um, San Diego to um, work with Scott McCake at the Swartz Center for Computation Neuroscience, where ICA basically was one of the methods that would allow this kind of approach that we're talking about today. And where we see like so much development over the last 15 years that I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm stoked to see what's going on in, um, in different areas at the moment. So let me give you um, a short introduction to what I think MOBI actually is. And what you will see here in the background is a video that we did um, for our lab here for one of the big DFG um, um, meetings, basically, at TU Berlin for the Berlin University Alliance. You will see preparation of a MOBI experiment in spatial navigation. And we're asking really what happens in the brain while participants are navigating. And usually what we do, and what you can see here too, is we try to compare stationary desktop setups. And even though the participant is standing, this is mimicking traditional desktop VR. You see the lab in the background, you see beautiful, clean, boring, as I would say, EEG data. And we then usually compare this kind of stationary setups with fully mobile EEG. And to be able to control the protocols, stimulation, and to directly compare what actively navigating participants um, do and how their brain dynamics support spatial orienting, we compare these mobile um, scenarios with stationary scenarios. And here you can see the EG again. It's not too bad in these kind of movements. You see there's no fast movement. There's no jerk, no jumps, nothing like that, but slow walking. So this is actually one of the easier um, MOBI conditions with respect to the walking, not to all the technical problems that we have and artifacts that come in from different sources, like the head-mounted display and other things. So, 
And I think to make the point here in this video, um, you actually see a patient um, that has the entire right hippocampus removed. Um, this was due to an, an epilepsy that was pharmaceutical in, intractable basically. So she got the entire right hippocampus removed and she's doing a virtual version of the water maze. I don't know whether you do the, uh, you know, the uh, Morris water maze task, but this is basically a task where you have to localize a position or an object in space based on information surrounding you. And usually what you can do is you use landmarks to triangulate a specific position, or you use landmarks as a beacon to move into a certain direction and then use distance to a border to localize a specific object in space. This is traditionally done in desktop scenarios and participants with hippocampal lesion or um, removed hippocampi um, are not able to do this because part of the neural structure that um, uses or is used for this kind of computation, triangulation based on allocentric spatial information is housed in or assumed to be housed in the hippocampus. And when participants do this kind of task in desktop, they fail. This patient um, can do the task in MOBI without any difference compared to age match controls, but she fails in the desktop condition. And this is one of the most impressive examples that we encountered during the last years um, that differentiates the desktop um, traditional setups that we use or have been using over decades now with newer mobile brain body imaging approaches. And I think it makes clear that mobile brain body imaging um, allows us to understand more natural cognition, the neural basis of more natural cognitive processes and natural behaviors. So mobile brain body imaging in that sense is a method to record and analyze brain and behavioral dynamics in the lab, but also in more naturalistic conditions even outside the lab. It's a method to investigate a wide range of scientific questions, um, analyzing human brain dynamics in combination with information derived from behavior. It's an integrative approach in that sense, um, because we want to include movement, behavioral aspects with EEG to understand, plus cognition to understand the relationship between all these three factors, cognition, brain dynamics, and behavioral dynamics. And this is on the one end of the continuum that I was talking about when we talked um, um, about um, Sarah's where Sarah would be basically on this continuum where Martin and Johanna were um, on the previous talk. So if you look at the information bandwidth um, regarding the brain dynamics, then you have our classical neuroimaging um, methods like MRI, MEG, where you have a very um, high bandwidth basically, um, but there is no movement. So the X axis would be brain dynamics. And then you have on the y axis, uh, y axis, the behavioral dynamics. And you would have not much of behavior in a scanner. This is one of the huge problems that we have in neuroimaging using functional magnetic resonance imaging that we cannot investigate actively behaving participants. The same time, and EEG over decades have not been um, much more um, open to movement due to artifacts contaminating the signal of interest. High density desktop EEG also carries a lot, millions of bits per second of information that we record here, but no behavioral dynamics, more or less, other than a button press. And then the other um, extreme points here would be then if we had like all the information from behavior, eye tracking, um, peripheral physiology, movement, everything basically that we can get and collect in combination with EEG or F years for that matter, as long as the brain imaging modality is mobile, portable, it can be used. And um, best solution obviously would be to combine F years with EEG plus eye tracking plus whatever we can get. But there are limitations with respect to the obstructivity, the movement range, the ability to basically naturally behave in space for our participants. But these would be the extreme ends on this side. If you look at low information bandwidth with regards to brain dynamics and behavioral dynamics, you, you're looking at low density desktop EEG F years experiments and then if you increase the movement range behavioral um, aspects, then you move up 
um, to on the left hand side to the low density mobile EG and eye tracking, whatever you get. So and so I, I I think that mobile brain body imaging is just somewhere located here on this uh, in this area. I don't know whether you can see my mouse. I hope let's get the laser pointer. So would be somewhere in this range, obviously, whereas mobile EEG moves towards this area. And again, we had that in the discussion before. It really doesn't matter. Um, what you name it. Um, the question is, what is your research goal? What would you like to investigate? And that determines the methods, the hardware that you combine to get this kind of information. Nonetheless, and for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk only about EEG, but keep in mind that FNIRS and maybe in the future, even portable MEG, um, optically pumped magnometers might be a new method um, that can be used in mobile brain body imaging studies. So the number of channels, the density, and that was one of the questions we had previously, also determines obviously what kind of analysis approaches you can use. So if you have a very high density, um, forgive me, Dan, um, I'm going to send you a picture of my, of me in the lab with the same setup for your talks in the future. This is Dan Ferris, um, and this is a picture actually from somewhere around 2008, where we've been working on the first treadmill mobile brain body imaging setup in San Diego together when he was on a sabbatical. So if you have this very high density of EEG, then obviously you have restrictions in the freedom to move, to turn your head because you have tons of cables. In this case, it was 256 channels. Um, but if you move to like a very low density, while you increase your mobility, you decrease the degrees of freedom for specific analysis approaches. And if you are interested in specific features, like um, Stefan Debna and his group did in this study here with the secret that I was talking about already, um, then they could show that you can extract these features like a P3, an outball P3, very reliable over long durations, over an entire day in the morning and again in the afternoon. And as long as that is your interest for this study, then this is the best solution to, to go because you have all the degrees of freedom to move around. It's uh, unobtrusive. People don't even see that. It's like near invisible EEG. And future developments with in-ear EEG might push that even further. So if that is your interest, then that's a great method. Why you have restricted analytical um, options only for this very low density montage. On the other side, if you have like all these other hardware um, um, components synchronized and you have head-mounted virtual reality, you have like high density EG, you can do more analytical um, approaches. You can do ICA, you can do whatever you want to do with that because you have simply more degrees of freedom, but at the same time, the movement is less natural. So there's a trade-off between the amount of hardware that we mount on our participants, the naturalness of the movement and thus the cognitive processes and the underlying brain dynamics. And, um, and we move in this field between um, having all options to analyze our data um, to only a few specific features and the mobility that increases or decreases regarding the amounts of hardware that we put on the participants. So this is just to, to localize the talks and the approaches that we heard about today in this continuum of mobile EEG to mobile brain body imaging. And the question why MOBI is relevant, I think was neatly answered by Martin Seber today already. If you look at this, on video, you can see uh, a rat moving around in this encounter. What you can hear, hopefully, is a single cell. It's a hippocampal place cell. And this cell fires only when the rat moves into a specific area of this um, 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 box here. And that is the upper rat area that you just heard again. So the point that I would like to make here is that these neurons, neuropopulations in specific brain regions are active only 
when the animal moves or are significantly less active when there's only one sensory modality delivering this kind of information. And this is basically as Margaret Wilson coined it um, because cognitive processes are deeply rooted in the body's interaction with the world. Movement itself will change brain dynamics. And this is one aspect of why movement impacts what our brain does and what we record. A second example is this by Warren Dickinson here. This is a, a super nice paper in PNAS in 2015. What you can see here is single cell recordings in actively flying or resting fruit flies. So Drosophila um, is glued basically to the stick that you can see here. So it's not actually moving in space, but it can fly or it can rest on an air, um, a mouse ball, a track ball, basically. And if you look at the activity and compare quiescent versus flying fruit fly neurons in the fan shaped body, and I'm going to show that in a second, you can see drastic differences. And where Dickinson basically states here, whereas neuroarchitecture remains relatively static, that means the connection between different areas, between different neural populations that are active in specific tasks and behavioral settings, this remains relatively static, but the functional connectivity, the amount of information transferred between these areas, between populations, changes almost instantaneously according to the behavioral context. And I give you um, an example. So this fruit fly basically um, sees this white stripe moving from the left to the right. And there are two conditions that you can see in this video. The one is quiescent, so it's sitting, it's resting, it's not flying. And the other one is flying. In the second row here, you can see um, three different animals. All have um, single cell recordings of four neurons and the fan-shaped body, that's an area in the fruit fly that's median between visual input and motor output. And it's not controlling flight per se or the movement itself, but it's mediating from the visual input to the motor output basically. So the fruit flies see the exact same visual input by resting or by flying. This is resting. So the last row here, you can see this is a fan-shaped body, the neurons that are recorded and you can see the single neurons being active or inactive here in the last row. And if you look at resting fruit flies, you see these neurons are not active, but with the identical visual input during flying, these neurons drastically change the activation pattern. And this is a clear, um, well, it's clearly showing that the behavioral state impacts the brain dynamic state. And this makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think it is reasonable to assume that this is also the case in humans. Then why didn't we record brain dynamics and actively behaving participants until 15 years ago? Well, that's also pretty obvious because some of the traditional brain imaging modalities that we use are not able to follow participants' movement. Um, we force participants to lie supine in a scanner, um, to watch visual information, to see visual information, acoustic information, but not being able to actually respond other than button presses or anything else. Minor movements, but there are some kind of um, bicycle and other um, um, setups that are now available for scanning, but it's still not a natural movement. The same is true actually for EG. We've been recording EG and forced participants to sit in dimly lit rooms, not allowed to move the head, not to press the jaws, whatever, so that we um, keep the data clean that we record. And what we do in all these traditional mobile brain, uh, sorry, in all these traditional brain imaging setups is we record millions of bits per second of information about the brain. And we compare that with one bit per second or less. Um, with respect to the behavior. And that is a button press at the end of the trial. This is the traditional setup. And this is not what the brain evolved to do. The brain evolved arguably to optimize the outcome of our behavior. So we are motor beings. We 
behave, we act, we react to environmental changes. And what we investigate are the very limits of our cognitive architecture, basically, by forcing participants to sit still. So we assume that active behavior influences brain dynamics. And we also know that active behavior, even planning specific behaviors, already changes how the brain processes information about our outside world. So then Mobi is one solution to add this perspective to the existing knowledge that we gained. And it's important knowledge, obviously, that we gained from all these traditional imaging methods over the last decades. So how can we do mobile brain body imaging? And I'm going to give you our um, specific setup here um, that you have seen in the lab, in the background, that the Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Lab. And you see a prototypical setup that we use in our lab where we have EEG as the imaging modality for brain activity. So you can use FNIRS, as I said, you can use any kind of mobile brain imaging device. And um, then if we want to understand how behavior influences the brain or how the brain controls behavior, like gait, you have to synchronize the brain dynamics that we record with the behavior. And that is usually done with motion capture. In this case, you see the face-based system that I've been talking about before. This is an active LED system. And what you can see here, the red sensors, um, emitters, basically LED, um, that have an identity. In addition to the synchronized data streams, we use often, but not always, had mounted virtual reality because this still allows us to control the experimental protocol to stimulate, to provide information whenever we want while controlling all other factors that we might not be able to control in the real world. So in that sense, it's a compromise that allows us to do kind of traditional experimental approaches with controlled protocols, but now add the active behavior of participants to the set of data that we record. And this is obviously not trivial. Sava has been talking about this. Um, Laugan's call is going to talk about um, the LSL, the lab streaming layer architecture tomorrow. This is one of the central software packages that we use to synchronize different data streams. And LSL or lab streaming layer um, can be used to synchronize multimodal data. And you basically can stream anything that has um, basically an interface to stream data online that can be then synchronized. LSL will provide a mother clock. And with that mother clock, you can um, synchronize line different streams of different sample rates online. You can extract information, for example, if you have a specific position from your motion capture, you can basically extract that and provide information to the participant whenever the participant, for example, is in a specific location that you predefined or looks in a specific direction. And synchronization and recording of multimodal data is non-trivial, but also um, the same is true for um, analyzing multimodal data. And there is not yet the best solution to do that. Actually, we are right in the beginning in this field, and there are no um, straightforward standardized approaches how to analyze multimodal data. Um, here you can see a screenshot of the Mobi Lab. That's an initial software that um, we started in San Diego. Alejandro Ojeda was um, the one who developed this. And lots of functions from this um, toolbox, basically, were used for the Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Lab pipeline, the BMOBI pipeline that we're going to talk about in the next days. So these, all the synchronization, I'm um, doing the recording, but also the, analyze, uh, the, uh, the analysis of synchronized data is non-trivial. And obviously if you have movement, and we have seen that before in all of the talks um, today, is that we have to use data-driven analysis approaches to dissociate brain from non-brain activity. We will encounter tons of non-brain activity that are not necessarily artifactual. So I would redefine, and um, Sarah did that um, already in her talk, I would redefine artifact from the traditional EEG perspective because eye movement is functional with respect to reaching a cognitive goal. 
neck muscle activity is functional. And you will see that in um, an example here. But to make the point, if you have, if you had only two brain sources oscillating at 10 hertz in the left motor cortex here and the right parietal cortex here, um, this is a video down, um, um, slow down basically, so that we can see what happens. If you have these cortical sources oscillating with slightly different alpha frequencies, and you back project these sources to the surface of the skull, what you can see is that there is a linear mixture of all these sources at any given sample. So you won't be able to dissociate the contribution on the sensor level only without analytical methods to, to know what comes from the left motor cortex and what comes from the right parietal cortex. And what you can see is obviously due to volume conduction, you will record this kind of activity everywhere across the skull and not only directly above the sources that are active. If you now add more complex setups like we've seen before, where you have strong movement in this case, we have um, tons of impact because participants is running on the treadmill. There's cable sway. There will be head movement. There will be eye movement. There will be tons of activity that is not originating from the brain. Um, then we have to use these kind of data-driven analysis approaches to dissociate these different sources. And the data that you get from this kind of setup does not look nice. And you, most of you might have seen something like that. This is, um, look at the scale here. This is 50 microvolts. This here is 50 microvolts. And then you can imagine what is going on in this EEG signal. This is not nice to see. And Sarah would say this is, is exciting data, I assume. But this is also troublesome because you want to get rid of all these non-brain contributions to what you measure on the sensor level. And ICA, we've been talking about that, would be one option to decompose your signal and to basically um, dissociate brain from non-brain activity. This is what we did here. And you see all the hardware that we synchronized here, EMG, EEG, we had like a force measuring treadmill. This is a treadmill from Dan Ferris back then in Michigan. We had the um, display, obviously we had motion capture and all these data streams were combined. Using all the information, extracting gate cycle information, we were able to clean this kind of a signal and to get to information um, or the brain dynamics underlying the oddball task, the visual oddball task that participants were doing while standing, slow walking and running on the treadmill. We could analyze the signal even while participants were running. Here you can see the results of the ICA decomposition across the sample of participants here. And in yellow, you can see neck muscle ICs or independent components reflecting neck muscle activity. While in gray, you see components that would reflect eye movement activity and then color-coded brain sources. But what you can see here is that you have tons of neck muscle activity. This was a topic we talked about um, today already. And again, neck muscle in this task are functional because they stabilize the head in 3D space. When you run on the treadmill, your head moves in space in three dimensions. It goes up and down, goes left and right and back and forth. Your eyes will compensate for that because you want to see what's happening in front of you. You want to have a stable retinal image. So your head will be stabilized by neck musculature and then eye movement will compensate also. So neck muscles are functional with regards to reaching the cognitive goal that is to be able to respond to uh, relevant stimulus. Okay, um, I would now like to give you one example only, but I would like to walk you slowly through this experiment, which is dear to me and really old. We started recording the data and been analyzing the data for years now. Um, it's fantastic data. It's under review again, and it's about heading computation. So I'm trying to make a point here how we can use movement information, behavioral information to inform cognitive and brain dynamic processes to better understand what is going on in the brain and the neural dynamics that subserve specific, in this case, spatial cognitive functions. It's a different example than the gate examples we've been seeing from Johanna and from Martin. 
it is not so much about understanding what happens during GATE and what are the brain dynamics that basically support GATE. But here we're looking into the brain dynamics that support orientation in space, heading changes in space. And it is a pretty simple example, but it's not so easy and not straightforward to try to get together the behavior and the brain dynamics and the cognitive outcome. And I'm trying to show you what we did. So the task was a very simple task. It was simple rotation on the spot. You can see the setup here before the lab was renovated. This is the same lab. And you can see the setup again here. So it's the head-mounted virtual reality display. We place a rigid body on top of that so that we can track the head and the torso on the shoulders. You saw the LEDs so that we had like torso rotation and head rotation while participants turned on the spot. The same backpack solution, back then it was not yet the Zotex, but um, still um, um, this is a setup that you saw um, um, previously in the lab. So what was the task? So here you can see the participant from above. Um, here's the nose front, the head mounted display. And participants were standing in, um, in, in, uh, on a spot. They saw in VR an orienting beacon that was then replaced unpredictable on a trial with a sphere that started moving to the left or to the right and ended unpredictably on a trial at different eccentricities between 30 and 150 degrees to the left and to the right. Then the sphere would change its color and that was the imperative stimulus for participants now to rotate back to indicate their initial heading. We used different velocity profiles for the sphere to, to rotate outwards were always the same distance. So we tried to minimize information that participants could extract from pure visual flow. So they then rotated back and indicated their initial heading and their response basically gave us, gave us all the performance parameters we needed like overestimation, underestimation of the real original heading and um, time for the outward rotation, backward rotation, and things like that. Crucially, and this is one of the approaches that we usually um, run in the lab, is we compare the mobile condition with the stationary condition, just as you saw for the patient in the Morris uh, water maze task. And with this kind of approach, we try to replicate previously observed brain dynamics that we know from desktop scenarios where we have the most complex spatial navigation tasks with participants sitting or lying in a scanner, not being allowed to move, but only receive visual flow information through some kind of a display. And then they respond using key presses, joystick or whatever. And we compare this kind of traditional desktop setup with the Mobi setup where they had the full degree of freedom to rotate using all the natural senses. The visual input is more or less identical in these two conditions. It's a within subject design. And when you look at the performance, what you can see on the X axis is the eccentricity in degrees of the end position, the end point of the outward rotation. And you see um, the mean absolute error in the heading reproduction as a function of the eccentricity of the outward rotation. And what you can see in blue here is the result from the stationary 2D setup. And you see a nice monotonic, nearly linear increase um, of the absolute error with increasing eccentricity of the end position of the outward rotation. Now, if you compare that with the full mobile condition, you see there's a main effect statistically significant between the two movement conditions. So during the full body rotation, the errors were significantly less pronounced. And it's a really nice range here, somewhere around six degrees, even though the, the VR, the stationary desktop condition was already pretty good. What you can see beyond that is that you have a non-increasing absolute error up to somewhere around 100 degrees, but then this increases even in the physical rotation condition. And that results in a significant interaction of movement times eccentricity. The eccentricities were also a main effect statistically significant. And this nicely reflects rotations 
within your principal body axis. So every time you cross the 90 degrees, you basically turn around and leave the frontal field of view that you have and you don't need to represent. But if you turn around, you somehow start to represent that space that you now leave, um, you rotate out of that space. And with that kind of um, rotation, you basically increase um, um, with the absolute error. And when you reproduce your initial head. So these results were very promising, were very nice. We could replicate what we know from the literature. And now the question was, can we find some kind of a velocity dependent modulation of brain and non-brain activity during this kind of physical rotation that would inform the cognitive process that would allow orientation in this task? And to this end, let me walk you through the workflow. So I'm looking at some non-brain sources here like neck muscles that you can see here in this picture. So this is an ICA decomposition and a subsequent um, equivalent dipole model that you see here. The small spheres represent independent components of single participants, and the bigger sphere represents the cluster centroid. And this cluster here is located more or less outside the gray matter, nicely aligned with the skull. And if you look at the um, spectrogram and the time course of activation, um, you can see that this reflects muscle activity. So what we did now is we basically used the ongoing activity, the behavior, and extracted the velocity. So we computed the derivatives of um, um, location data, extracted velocity, and then we epacked the data according to specific velocities and sorted the different velocity epochs. And you can see that here. So we sorted them basically from the lowest 10% to the highest 10% rotation velocity, so angular velocity. And this is a relative binning that is known in, in, in the rodent literature, where you can see um, similar approaches by Bassett and Taube, for example, in 2001. And um, so with that, you basically reserve the same number of trials relatively um, in all these bins, and you do not have like only a very small number of trials in the very fast and the very low rotation velocities, for example. So this is a relative binning. And what we would expect here is that if you compute different frequencies, so you use a Hilbert transform of your EEG data for all these different frequency bands from four to 30 in non-overlapping bands, you compute the Hilbert transform, you compute the amplitude of that, and then you have sorted EEG amplitude that is sorted according to the velocity of the rotation. And if there is an impact of angular velocity on brain dynamics, then you should see some kind of grading in these kind of displays. Okay, so this is the rationale. What we then did is we proceeded and computed a dissimilarity matrix. Um, you know that um, from Neely et al, that um, you can do um, um, representational similarity um, matrices, and we used the Malanobis distance. It's a multidimensional measure for two dimensions would be same as a Euclidean distance. Um, so in this case, we used Malanobis distance to compute the differences between all the frequency bands, different rotation velocities, and compared the stationary with the mobile condition. This gives you a 180 times 180 um, dissimilarity matrix. And if you look at one of these squares, you again have the sorting from the lowest to the highest movement velocities. And you have that for all the different frequencies. Again, um, the differences between if you look at that, that would be the difference within the physical rotation condition. Then this would be the difference within the joystick rotation condition. And here you have the comparison between the two, the stationary and the mobile condition across all velocities and frequencies. And then obviously you run some kind of a permutation with 10,000 um, repetitions or 10,000 permutations basically here with a significance levels of 0.05 to see what actually differs in these um, 180 times 180 dimension. Okay, so, and then this gives you the entire workflow basically. So you have a specific cluster of 
ICs that represent specific brain dynamics. These are sorted according to the velocity profile of the behavior. And if there is some kind of impact of velocity on the brain dynamics, the amplitude of the Hilbert transform, then you would see some kind of striping in this picture. Then we compare that across all the different frequency velocities and conditions, movement conditions, and compute the statistics. And what you can see here is the actual data of the neck muscle during this outward rotation. What you can see is there is a striping, there is a clear pattern in the physical rotation condition, not so much in the joystick rotation condition. And what you can see here, most importantly, is you have pronounced differences between the mobile, the full physical rotation condition, and the joystick condition. And in the upper triangle, you see that there are differences in different frequency bands during physical rotation in the neck muscle cluster. But if you look at the triangle that represents the differences in the desktop condition, there is nothing. And that makes a lot of sense because people are not moving their head in the joystick condition. They just use a joystick to do the rotation while here they actively rotate following different velocity profiles, but produce different velocities during that rotation. And this is reflected in amplitude modulations and differences between different frequency bands and velocities. This is a proof of a principle that this kind of approach works. And now I'm going to speed up a little bit um, because we are obviously interested in the brain. I am interested in the brain. And so here you can see um, a cluster that is located in or near the retrospranial complex. And this is one of the most exciting uh, regions for spatial cognition because it's a hub that translates between the egocentric sensory information that you uh, information that you process coming in from the outside environment and that is translated based on heading information that is anchored to allocentric visual acoustic or whatever kind of landmarks into an allocentric representation and vice versa it is a hub that is necessary and super important for spatial orienting processes and what you can see here is that we have, again, many, um, um, an impact of um, um, rotation velocity on the brain dynamics in quite a wide range of frequency bands. But this is also the case for the visual, pure visual desktop condition. You see that the magnitude here goes down a lot, but that we still have mostly in the lower alpha and alpha frequency band a clear modulation and differences um, dependent on the velocity um, for the mobile physical rotation and that there are tons of differences in different frequency bands going up to the better range between physical rotation and desktop rotation. And you do have differences dependent on the velocity in different frequency band also in the joystick condition. And these are significant. So this is an important first information that we got. And let me give you like another really um, impressive insight that we got from this kind of approaches. And this is the occipital cortex. This is a cluster located in or near the visual cortex. And you can see that in the physical joystick rotation, there's nearly nothing going on dependent on the velocity. But in the joystick condition, there is tons of modulation dependent on the velocity, mainly around the 10 Hertz. If you look at the differences, this is most pronounced in all frequencies up to the better band. If you look at the joystick condition again, there is clear modulation of the visual cortex um, depending on the velocity. But if you look at the physical rotation, there is nothing that would be modulated dependent on the velocity. And this is a very, maybe not surprising, but impressive result. I would think that might be explained by um, a simple predictive um, coding approach or reference principle. When you know that you turn, you know the velocity that you turn with because it's an active behavior that you execute and plan in advance, you basically are not surprised by the changes in sensory input that comes back from that behavior. In that sense, the occipital cortex might not be associated with processing the mismatch between all the sensory streams coming in. For example, like in the desktop condition where your visual sense tells you you're rotating, but your vestibular and proprioceptive senses tell you, no, you're not. Okay, so this is super nice. 
And now looking into the temporal modulation of this activity, again, the RSC, sorry, excuse me. This is um, a different way of depicting this kind of cluster that we have here. Um, so again, we're looking at RSC and we're now looking at the time course of event-related spectral perturbation. On the x-axis, you see movement, stimulus onset, movement onset, and movement offset. Absolute time is lost because we compute a time warped event related spectral perturbation patterns here. So you take every single trial and because they differ in length for short outward rotation, depending on the speed of the rotation, long outward rotations, for example, <clears throat> excuse me. So you extract the median latencies of all these events. Stimulus onset is always same, it's zero, then movement onset and movement offset. And then you compute the single tri spectrogram, and then you linearly warp these single tri spectrogram to these median events, and then you average, giving you this kind of event related, time warped event related spectral perturbation pattern. Um, the same approach that Johanna used and Martin also uses for 100% gate cycle, for example. On the y axis, you see um, the frequency from three to 60, and everything in blue is a desynchronization compared to the baseline where they were simply standing and looking at the orienting beacon, beacon and not rotating. And everything in red will be a synchronization increase in power um, compared to a baseline. What you can see here in this plot is the standard that we always find in all the desktop experiments is that we have a strong desynchronization in the 10 Hertz range. Um, and we also have like desynchronization in the higher frequency ranges plus a phase reset basically in the theta range with onset of the stimulus. This looks entirely different for active physical rotation. There is no 10 Hertz desync, no alpha desync in general, but a general strong synchronization in the lower frequency range during the rotation. And the differences are obviously um, already significant across the board. So let me wrap this up. I wanted to show you that if we record, if we leave standard desktop scenarios, if we start moving around, that the movement itself will produce activation coming in from our sensors that by definition will change the brain dynamics we know. Because we usually never allow active behavior. If you then move into the outside world, like Anna did in this GPS navigation assistance study, um, where you record EEG and actively behaving participants, but then you can't control people honking, you know, like social density, um, um, build density, whatever, nothing you can control. That in addition will obviously will have an impact. Sarah talked about that. So we try to get as much information as possible to extract additional events to inform what we can do with the EEG data, but a lot of that will not be controlled. Nonetheless, these kind of settings will change brain dynamics as we know them from traditional desktop scenarios. And in summary, I think it is clear already, and we have shown that behavioral states of participants will influence the brain dynamic states. And specifically with respect to the power spectrum in diverse, diverse brain areas, there will be changes that we might have no idea about. Um, and that might be more drastically different than event-related potentials, which might reflect more basal processes, specifically with early components. And this goes back a little bit to the question I think that Louis um, Chuang just asked um, in the previous talk. So what are the features? What are the common denominators of mobile EEG or mobile brain body imaging in the future? We have to basically replicate, we have to establish new parameters that might diverge or uh, differ significantly from what we know from traditional desktop scenarios. These frequency modulations specifically may vary depend on task and behavior, and in some cases might reflect simple sensory mismatch, as I tried to show you in the spot rotation task. And eventually, mobile brain body imaging provides, from my perspective, um, new insights into human brain dynamics, accompanying more natural embodied cognitive processes, but also more natural behaviors, like gait in general, for example.
And this allows in turn for new diagnostic tools and investigations of brain dynamics underlying adaptive cognitive and neuronal processes and will offer us with tons of opportunity for the future to address old questions with new met methods to gain new insights. And I think that after 15 years of research, and this is what we're approaching now, um, Mobi proves to be a robust new method. There is more and more development in hardware and analytical approaches that push the field forward. And this allows for new strategies to investigate human brain activity and cognition and behavior in ecologically valid scenarios. And with that, I like to end and thank all the team members that have been involved in the data that I've shown today, um, but there's um, more um, of experiments going on and other team members working on different questions in the lab. Um, okay, so thank you very much.